Hi, my name is Yap Mehun and welcome to episode 7 of Breakfast at FOM, a series of weekly online series which bring you updates on, on uh, various topics in the field of medicine. Um, in conjunction with World Sepsis Day, falls on the 13th of September every year, the um, ICU of the Malaysia Centre and the Malaysian Society of Intensive Care have organised today's forum entitled Stop Sepsis, Save Life. We post questions in the Q&A section and we'll try to answer them at the end if we have time. Without further ado, let me introduce our distinguished speakers. We have with us today Professor Dr. Noor Azim bin Mohamed Yunus, Intensivist. Thank you. Associate Professor Dr. Sharifah Farida bin Tisai Umar, Infectious Disease Consultant. And Dr. Khadija Po Yuan-Yong, Emergency Physician. Good morning. My first question is views on the level of awareness among um, the general public as well as healthcare providers with regards to sepsis. Uh, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, my quick answer to that is uh, we could do better. See, uh, sepsis is a global issue, and uh, if you look at the uh, data released by WHO recently, in 2017, uh, about uh, 47 million people worldwide uh, were affected by uh, sepsis, yeah? and out of this, uh, 11 million died, and, and that's a huge uh, number. And in certain areas like the uh, lower and middle countries, right, this uh, death could uh, 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 this sepsis death uh, contribute contributed to about 20% uh, of the total death. Now, so, so that's um, Serious uh, global data, and if you look at the uh, our own Malaysian data, and I would like to use the uh, data from the Malaysian Institute of Intensive Care, so that's the uh, annual uh, data uh, compiled by our uh, local uh, intensive colleagues. So sepsis and septic shock. Septic shock here uh, refers to the uh, extreme end of the sepsis. Uh, they both uh, consistently uh, year in and year out. Uh, you know, contributed uh, or, or were the main causes of uh, ICU admission, uh, as well as um, uh, the main causes for uh, in the ICU. Last two years data, the um, public uh, awareness to, to this, uh, you know, the seriousness of the sepsis issue still lacking. We take uh, cardiovascular diseases uh, uh, comparison where we talk about heart attack in medically related acute syndrome. Uh, public uh, all that uh, have uh, severe uh, crushing chest pain. Uh, you, uh, you need you know to go to the hospital early, right? And uh, when uh, get admitted to the hospital, uh, the uh, medical practitioners uh, we are all uh, aware, well aware of the uh, protocols, established protocols, the catchy mantras like you know time is muscle. You need to have this uh, door to needle uh, time using specific uh, targets. So uh, this is still lacking in sepsis. So we, we, we need uh, to address this uh, on both fronts, the, the public as well as the healthcare uh, practitioners ourselves. Okay, thank you, Prof. My next question is for Prof Sharifa. Um, Prof, can you tell us what is sepsis and what makes it so lethal? Thank you, Mindy, for that question. Um, very good morning to all. So, sepsis, um, when somebody gets an infection, naturally the body will want to fight that infection. And it does it by um, releasing uh, or activating the immune system. So, phagocytosis happens, the inflammatory uh, cascade is activated, and also at the same time, pro inflammatory and also anti inflammatory agents are released. So these in inflammatory agents are there to regulate the inflammatory response. So hopefully with this response, the infection can be controlled and uh, the tissue injury can, can be repaired immediately. However, in sepsis, what happens is um, these pro-inflammatory mediators exceed uh, the anti-inflammatory mediators. So you get this um, excessive uh, inflammatory response, if you like. Uh, so now the response once instead of tackling or just targeting the infection, it goes beyond the boundaries of the environment. And this leads to a more generalized response. So you end up with a 
clinical syndrome, which has biological causes, biochemical abnormality, physiological uh, consequences, which is caused by the deregulation of the host immune response. And this leads to multi-organ failure and eventually it can lead to death itself. So it's not just the infection, but the response or the over response to the infection leads to sepsis and multi-drug, uh, sorry, um, uh, multi-organ uh, failure and also death. All right. Thanks, um, Prof. When one mentions sepsis, it's usually assumed that the culprit is a bacterial infection. Is this always true? Um, so any pathogen can lead to sepsis. Bacteria is the commonest culprit, uh, but you do see in recent years an increase in uh, sepsis caused by fungal infection. And uh, so no, is it okay? Yep. And uh, I mean the recent uh, uh, pandemic of SARS-CoV-2 shows you that viruses can also cause sepsis and uh, septic shock and so on. Thank you very much, Prof. Khadija, my next question is for you. Uh, as a doctor working in the emergency department, what are some of the common causes of community-acquired sepsis that you see among your patients? And what kind of symptoms do they usually present with? Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so basically, in the emergency department, um, although technically speaking, our respiratory tract uh, is quite um, susceptible to getting infections, and we do see that quite a lot, as in like, non-septic patients coming to us with um, upper respiratory tract infection and that is very common. However, with sepsis, most of the time, the source of the infection is usually due to a low, low respiratory tract infection, which means a pneumonia, or um, also probably a ur urinary tract infection as well. And these are actually the commonest sources of infection, uh, which leads to sepsis. In addition to that, there are other sources as well. Obviously, if a person has an infected wound from, for example, trauma or just breakdown of the skin as a whole, um, there are other sources as well. For example, when the patient uh, comes into us specifically for uh, altered behaviour, we may think that the infection uh, has started from the brain. Having said that, an infection of the brain or, or also known as meningitis or meningoencephalitis um, usually comes from another source and commonly again it comes all the way back to our respiratory tract as well. In, um, besides that, one um, condition which usually leads to quite overt sepsis is actually leptospirosis or other zoonotic infections. Commonly comes into us is something which is of a diagnostic dilemma in a lot of uh, situations because the, press, the, the incidence is quite insidious. And um, another, uh, another uh, situation where we usually have to scratch our heads is when we have deep-seated sources of infection, specifically in the abdomen. You have to remember that the abdomen is quite big. There's a lot of uh, foci for infection there. And sometimes these patients come in to us with very, very vague symptoms. So coming to the symptom itself, we do hope that most of the time the septic patients come in to us with fever. Having said that, a lot of times, especially in uh, Petaling Jaya, where we have a very high geriatrics population, the patients come in to us very big. Uh, they come in to us uh, with reduced oral intake or even just lethargy. Um, otherwise, uh, the other uh, common sources of infection would usually come in together with the, the, the symptoms would tie in together with the source. So basically, if you have a respiratory tract infection, usually you have some cough, you know, sore throat, an increase in phlegm. If it's a urinary tract infection, we do hope that you have urinary tract infection symptoms, which is usually, you know, pain when you pass urine or called dysuria, blood in the urine, which is called hematuria. Or, but, but however, having said that, in urinary tract infections, again, the symptoms can be quite insidious and it's not that obvious. And again, sometimes the symptom is just you feeling generally unwell and just lethargic. Um, one important thing that we always have to take note is obviously the travel history, more so in the current pandemic, but however, travel history has always been an important component um, whenever we actually assess our patients who come in with possibly sepsis. Uh, Katija, how do you differentiate a patient with sepsis um, uh, compared to another patient with a milder form of, of an infection? Okay, as, as Prof. Sharifah I pointed out just now, usually when we have an infection, we do, our body naturally will respond to it. We, we, our body do not really like um, bacteria, you know, it doesn't really like the organism which is causing the infection. And usually we would respond to that kind of, uh, the, the presence of that particular pathogen. 
And the response is usually by, by having a fever most of the time. Um, however, also there are other things, for example, feeling lethargic uh, and, and also basically just under the weather. So these are normal responses. And as Prof Sharifah has pointed out just now, uh, what happens in sepsis is that there is an overt, disproportionate response to the infection itself. And that is where, obviously, you can see that the line is gray, very, very grey and very, very blurred. And a, a lot of times, it can get quite difficult uh, to assess. We do have some tools, though, to facilitate us in picking up whether this patient has sepsis. Um, uh, the, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, has uh, suggested that we use uh, what we call as SOFA score. Uh, although, having said that, in, during the initial contact of the patient to us, it may, you may have difficulties in assessing a full Q, uh, SOFA score, and that's the reason why they suggested that we use a Q SOFA score instead. Very reasonable uh, um, uh, uh, point uh, of assessing patients, especially if you think of sepsis as in uh, an infection which has caused organ dysfunction. And basically, when, when there is organ dysfunction, there is going to be certain uh, symptoms or signs which points towards organ dysfunction. We're talking about the brain, then obviously the patient has a bit of reduced mentation, okay, or probably heightened mentation uh, also. Uh, if you're talking about the heart, obviously the patient is going to be in a situation where the circulatory uh, situation is going to be compromised. And so uh, the patient will come in in what we call a shock, or basically, um, probably in the mentors, probably we're looking out for a low blood pressure. Uh, low, uh, however, a normal blood pressure may, may not mean that the patient is not in shock because there are other, other methods as well to assess whether a patient is in shock or not. And another thing is obviously going to be increased, heightened uh, breathlessness. So basically, when, when the organ affected is the lungs, then you have an increase in breathlessness. Obviously, there are other organs affected as well, especially the kidneys. Very, we're not really very obvious whenever you assess a patient. It's very difficult for you to actually check with them whether their kidneys are still functioning or not. Many a times when you actually check with them, you do get a history of reduced urine output as well. can be quite difficult in a patient who is septic. They may not be able to give us that part of the history. In the emergency department itself, we usually then progress and proceed to send in blood investigations. And hopefully we can pick up other uh, organ dysfunctions through blood investigations and the other forms of clinical assessment. Katija, any uh, new developments at the front line to help um, you combat sepsis? Um, to combat sepsis per se is probably um, a bit um, uh, too, too much on our side, but we do have tools to facilitate us in uh, addressing sepsis as well. As you know, um, nowadays we use a lot of ultrasound in our department and having that is obviously a big godsend to us. We do uh, perform a lot of uh, bedside scans and uh, this helps us in two senses. One, one is actually to pick up uh, to, to see how the patient's clinical condition is. So generally, of course, we would want to perform a, a full thorough clinical examination. But again, in a lot of situations, it's rather difficult for us to actually pick up that particular sign um, in a patient who is very, very ill. And the use of ultrasound not only tells us the sepsis situation as well, uh, itself, it also tells us uh, in terms of the patient's pre-morbid status. So why is it so important for us to use ultrasound in septic patients? It's because as all of us know we're probably we're giving a lot of fluids to in uh, to our septic patients but however if the patient has an underlying heart condition which makes them uh, amenable to um, uh, problems with uh, over over fluid resuscitation then we are actually pushing the tipping the patient off into a more uh, problematic situation by giving too much fluids uh, that's that's the, the pre-morbid status um, uh, if, if, for example, not because of the premorbid status, we can definitely look into the patient's fluid status per se, and we're actually looking directly into the heart and seeing how much fluid is actually being pumped out from the heart. And that will help us determine whether the patient's low blood pressure is due to purely a pump failure or if it's due to uh, basically the patient being dehydrated due to the sepsis uh, itself. Uh, in addition to that, ultrasound is also helpful in terms of looking out for the source of infection. Many a times when you have a patient who is breathless, we don't really know whether the breathlessness is due to purely the septic component or because there is an obvious infection within the lung. So lung ultrasound is proven to be helpful in terms of picking up uh, lung infections. Uh, some, some quite deep-seated uh, abscesses, for example, in the liver, we can probably be picked up with an ultrasound. Or even if you're dealing with a situation where you have 
um, uh, infections involving the muscles and the skin, you can also use your ultrasound scan for abscesses as well. So I would say probably that's the thing which helps us a lot in uh, managing uh, patients in the um, emergency department as of now, if you're talking about developments. Okay, Katija, I couldn't agree with you more. We too love our ultrasound in the ICU. <laughs> yep. uh, finally, can you tell us about some of the challenges you face um, while treating patients with, with sepsis in the ED? Okay, definitely identification is important. You know, identification, identification, identification. So uh, basically, if you don't really have it, you don't really think about it, you definitely won't, you won't see it. Uh, you only see what your mind knows. Okay, so um, for, for my um, ED comrades out there, basically uh, the main issue is again coming to the point where the patients come in to us, symptoms very, very vague, you're not really sure what is actually happening. You do have some things to point towards that kind of um, uh, condition. Uh, and you do hope that you're actually uh, dealing with the right condition, especially if you have a patient who can't really give you much of history. Uh, as I said just now, fluid resuscitation in a patient who is septic, it, you have to obviously really remember about the patient's pre-morbid status. We don't want to overtly give too much fluids to these patients. Uh, although, you know, you need to have this, that, that sweet spot. You don't want to under-resuscitate and you don't want to over-resuscitate to the extent of actually causing more organ failure. And... Um, uh, last but definitely not least is the multidisciplinary um, approach to actually managing where we actually need a lot of other teams for source control. Specifically, for example, if you say that the source of the infection is something which can be corrected surgically, either by the surgical team or by the orthopedics team, we definitely need uh, them to come in and uh, facilitate us in terms of source control. We do definitely need the ICU team uh, to help us in terms of getting the patient up uh, into the ICU. Not to say that we can't do <laughs> any of the treatment downstairs, but as you know, we keep on getting new septic patients and, and nursing ratio is definitely an issue there. So we do, 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 do need everyone's help in terms of managing our patients downstairs. Okay, thanks, Katija. So we've defined sepsis, um, identified some common causes and heard about how it can present. Um, next question is for Prof Sharifah. How do we best treat sepsis? Um, thanks, Mehun. Um, so when we talk about treatment, we always think about what's the drug to use, right? Um, what, what's the action to be taken? But I think when you treat sepsis, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, what Katija just mentioned just now about being able to identify somebody who has sepsis uh, and also to identify it correctly because it's not easy, it's very vague, the symptoms, the, the blood parameters, uh, it can overlap with a lot of other syndromes and diseases as well. Um, and again, as Katija has mentioned, once we have identified someone has, as possibly having sepsis, you know, sepsis is not there without infection. So it's not enough just to say this patient has sepsis, refer to medical or refer to ID, start antibiotics, right? Um, we, we need to take that step to really, really try and localize where the infection is coming from. And uh, um, uh, identifying the source using the resources that you have, imaging, investigations, and so on. Uh, clinical acumen is, is, is I, I think, um, we, we need to spend a bit more time with the patient, thorough history, uh, thorough examination, and most of the times you will be able to identify a source of, of sepsis or, or the infection. Then you come to treatment. So once you've established all this, then you, you will be able to treat the patient accordingly. So there's two things to treat here. One is the infection that caused the sepsis. So two is the sepsis itself. So infection, you know, um, it's not just antimicrobials. That is an important component of it. But source control is extremely, extremely, extremely important. So, um, you know, as Khadija has mentioned, you know, if, if, you, if you have like an abscess sitting there or a wound sitting there that's looking infected, being able to clean that, to drain that is, is very, very important. And no amount of antibiotics is going to clear a big abscess that's sitting in your in your organs or, or intra-abdominally, intra pelvically and so on. Um, so surgery is very important when needed, removing any sources of infection. So we have patients in ICU, for example, who get sepsis from a line. Uh, that's been sitting there. So removing that line, removing that source of infection is also very important. Antimicrobial comes later, or, or not comes later, it has to be started initially, but uh, right, right from the beginning, but um, uh, you know, it, it has to go together with the other measures as well. Um, on top of all this, it's also important to, uh, we, we hear about the sepsis bundle, right? 
Um, so it is also important to, to identify uh, patients who have poorer prognostic uh, outcomes when, if they do have sepsis. So some people, the younger ones, those without comorbidities, they have sepsis, you do the right thing, most of them will survive. But the mortality increases in some groups of patients. So the older you are, the more comorbid comorbidities you, ha you have. Um, the sites of infection, if you have a complicated intra-abdominal infection, you're more likely to die compared to if you just had a UTI. Uh, the types of infection, so nosocomial infection, multi-drug resistant infection, will cause more mortality compared to community-acquired infection. Um, what was done initially, so how soon did you give the antibiotics? How quickly did you restore the perfusion? That all, that all uh, influences your outcomes and the prognosis of the patient. So, uh, when you see someone with sepsis, you need to be able to identify sepsis, grade the sepsis in terms of its severity, and act upon the sepsis itself and also the infection, because this will definitely reduce the mortality overall. So besides direct admissions uh, from the ED to our ICU, we also admit patients who are initially not so ill, but then deteriorate uh, while, while in the ward. Prophazim, do we have any uh, tools to help healthcare providers identify these deteriorating patients to ensure a timely referral to the ICU team? Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to reiterate uh, what the, the, the two other panel members, uh, Sharifah and Khatija, uh, have elaborated. Uh, that uh, Just to emphasize the point that uh, uh, getting to the source of the uh, uh, sepsis is so very important. So, uh, we, we need to uh, spend more time, uh, clinical, acumen, uh, clinical acumen, as uh, Sharifah mentioned. And uh, uh, so, so this is uh, still the core uh, thing that we need to do. Yes, we do, we do have tools to help us to uh, uh, do better all right, in, in identifying uh, patients with sepsis. Uh, uh, blood cultures, uh, you know, doing the cultures, uh, imaging studies uh, to identify the source is one. And then uh, in the past, we used to, to rely on uh, measurements like uh, temperature and what cell count. And then uh, over the years, uh, uh, with emerging evidence, of scientific evidence, we also recognized that uh, uh, these are not so specific to, to sepsis. Uh, for example, if, if you have other uh, conditions, you, know, uh, you may have a high fever as well. You may have high white cell count. So, so in recent years, we have uh, uh, measurements like the C-reactive protein. And more recently, the procalcitonin. So uh, that uh, I mean, these these measurements have helped us to uh, a bit be a bit more uh, specific to our uh, sepsis treatment. Uh, it has helped us to, uh, for example, uh, limit uh, the duration of antibiotics. Maybe Sharifa later could, could uh, uh, elaborate on uh, why we want to be very judicious with uh, the use of uh, antibiotics in, in in treating sepsis patients. So we do have. Uh, uh, newer uh, tools or, or laboratory uh, investigations and maybe for the powers that be that that uh, listening all right uh, we, we should get uh, 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 these tools like procalcitonin uh, uh, more accessible to our patients and to our practice okay uh, kati just spoke earlier about community acquired sepsis um, prof azim is it possible for patients to de develop sepsis while in the ward uh, yes it's possible i think um uh, Sharifa alluded to that uh, just now that uh, she mentioned about the word nosocomial. So nosocomial, uh, in general terms, uh, refer to hospital acquired infection. So this uh, could happen uh, due to multiple factors, uh, essentially the environmental factors. Uh, some some certain locations in the hospital would have uh, a higher risk of uh, certain organisms uh, and, and also the patient factors. Uh, uh, patients uh, being in the hospital, being critically ill, uh, for example, uh, the uh, immune uh, defense uh, is affected, it's lower, and it could be lower or it could be lowered by um, medications related to the, uh, their own uh, diseases like uh, patients receiving chemotherapy. And, and sometimes when, when uh, patients are in the hospital, uh, they might be uh, having uh, lines, you know, uh, implants. So um, the uh, that uh, the healthcare practitioners need to be mindful of this, right? And uh, it also uh, uh, leads or, or brings us to the point that uh, it is so very important to practice uh, good infection control because uh, nosocomial infection or hospital acquired infection uh, is there, right? And uh, outcomes of uh, patients affected by nosocomial.
the PDF you tend to do with. I think last one for you. Uh, what is the toughest part of managing sepsis? So, so the toughest part uh, of managing patients uh, with sepsis in the ICU is when the sepsis uh, snowballs into septic shock and uh, multi organ failures, multiple uh, organs uh, being uh, affected and getting um, functional. Right? And, and these organs are uh, main organs, uh, the heart, uh, lungs, and so it may go down to a point of requiring uh, dialysis support, for example, renal replacement therapy. So uh, this is the challenging part. And um, so it is so very important to, to prevent sepsis and to stop sepsis. Um, question. So I'm sure our listeners are curious to know, are the bugs which cause community-acquired infections the same as those which cause nosocomial infections? general answer to that is no. Uh, basically, pathogens or bugs that causes no are often mostly drug resistant. Only found in samples of SMRAs. And some of the medication. And also now, you know, one of the biggest are I know you are quite familiar with in itself. So, pathogens in hospital causing sepsis. But from the community, most of them are still fairly sensitive to Is it possible to acquire these multi drug resistant organisms, I mean, multi drug resistant infections from the community? Of course, it's possible, um, especially dialysis centers, for example, this is a they don't. They don't get admitted to the hospital, but they have a lot of so they may have to be being colonized with that. Uh, but, you know, in a general setting, the general public who has to help, very, very unlikely for them. Because can you please explain how these bugs become resistant to antibiotics? That, that is the whole lecture, we <laughs> Um, I think any living thing needs to survive, right? Uh, so, bugs uh, or bacteria, uh, they, they develop mechanisms to survive the stock of antibiotics. So, exposure to any antibiotic will lead to uh, the bacteria itself develops mutation uh, and the bugs, they need to survive. And so in the future, when you use the antibiotic again, it may not work or it may not work at all. So the genes that there can be transferred on to another bacteria and um, right. um, so resistant bacteria, when you try the antibiotic again, uh, it may not work through several methods. So uh, they're so clever that they can test the antibiotic. Yeah. They can actually, you know, once the antibiotics enters the cells, they can actually pump it out again. You know, they, they have this pump uh, effect mechanism. Um, they, the the couple panemesis, uh, the CREs that we're so uh, scared of nowadays, you know, you give them a couple panem a and it actually they produce enzymes that completely destroy the antibiotics. Uh, they can bypass the antibiotics target uh, for, for destroying the bacteria. Uh, so there's many ways for them to do it. But I think the, the, the main thing is once you are exposed to an antibiotics, it's natural for the bacteria to find a way to develop uh, mutations so that in the system, like that. And can you tell us what 
Thank you. Thank you. Healthcare provider. <laughs> everybody, everybody. I think judiciary. I mean, uh, I didn't know about judiciary. So we also think about hospital teams um, in in the setting of that thing. So as we had mentioned, the death diagnosis is there for the terms of but. If we may do not diagnose properly or that's it. So it's very important for all providers, anyone who can prescribe an appropriate thing to have the antibiotic. Public, so the best you are exposed to antibiotics. So if you can die with a recent infection, you can go to this antibiotic group. But if you are to buy can properly see with the health provider to do antibiotics. Uh, source control for him. If you do not, you do not cause the disposing to this longer duration. Yes, if the yeah. um, I mean, how has the medical profession program you know fight against that? Okay, I, I'm pleased to see that uh, over the uh, last couple of decades uh, that being uh, efforts to raise the awareness and uh, have to be a good example of, uh, of that effort. And uh, over the last couple of decades as well, uh, we've seen uh, emerging uh, evidence and, and uh, this evidence comes from uh, both uh, clinical trials as well as big data. Uh, over the years, uh, we have a lot of uh, computerized uh, data of uh, Hospital emissions of patients with sepsis, and uh, this big data have uh, been incorporated with our knowledge, our the body of knowledge on sepsis. For example, uh, 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 both uh, uh, evidence from clinical trials and from big data have been used to uh, refine our definition of uh, sepsis. Uh, uh, Sharifah mentioned about the importance of uh, identifying sepsis uh, properly so that uh, we uh, describe the right uh, treatment. So, um, uh, and, and this is an international effort, right? So, uh, there, there, there is um, an international consensus on the definition of sepsis. Uh, Katida mentioned about the use of the SOFA and the Q SOFA. So, that's actually from sepsis 3, which has evolved uh, over the last 20 years from sepsis 1 to sepsis 2. So, that's uh, an encouraging uh, development, and I'm sure that it will continue, uh, you know. Uh, in the future years. Uh, and uh, from the emerging evidence as well, um, again, there's an international effort to uh, uh, put minds together and, and come up with uh, guidelines. Uh, a best example is probably the uh, surviving sepsis guidelines, uh, which have now come into its uh, third or fourth uh, uh, edition. Right? So with these guidelines and uh, based on, uh, on uh, evidence, uh, the clinicians uh, are more focused and, and are giving better and uh, more appropriate treatments. I could take uh, um, information about fluids, right, which is important for uh, in resuscitating patients with sepsis. So uh, over the years, if I look back into uh, my practice as a junior doctor, um, you mentioned about the judicious use of fluids. Uh, we, we tend to be a bit more flexible, you know, and free in terms of giving fluids then, right? And over the years. Uh, Evidence uh, started to come in showing that uh, you're more uh, careful if you uh, use uh, better parameters uh, to guide your uh, with uh, resuscitation. You could avoid uh, longer period of ventilation. If they could, you could, uh, you know, 
to influence the, the outcome and so on. So, so nowadays uh, we are we are more careful about uh, how uh, we the volume that we transfuse, uh, the what volume that we give uh, for the uh, for the patients, as well as the choice of uh, fluid. We give a lot of colloids, and uh, more recently we have switched to colloids, and these are all evidence. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, the uh, we are getting better, but uh, we need the uh, the help from everyone, and it should be a multidisciplinary effort. Yeah, and with that, we've reached the end of our forum. Um, any take home messages from the speakers, Katija? Right. Uh, oh, so basically, uh, two target audiences. One would be the public, where it's um, very important for you to come to us early. Uh, how how do you know whether you should come to us early? Is when you're disproportionately ill. To the condition, so you you usually have your uh, respiratory tract infection. You know how how ill you're supposed to be, but when it gets a bit disproportionate, do come to us. My ED comrades, well, if the patient comes in early, don't scold them because they're there for a reason. They don't know what is actually happening to them. Uh, so basically, uh, look into them properly. Um, tell them what is to be expected. If, for example, after your assessment, you feel that they're actually not ill enough to come to our department, then just educate them well. Tell them what are the things which points towards whether the, the infection is getting out of hand or whether the infection is as expected of its uh, natural progression. I have a very high index of transmission for sepsis, especially the ones who come in uh, with very, very big, big symptoms. And as soon as you have that transmission, treat early, treat aggressively, talk to the other teams as soon as possible because this is uh, a, repeat, uh, a multidisciplinary approach and you can't actually manage sepsis alone. That would be it. Thanks, Katija. Um, so, as an ID physician, I really hope that we could come when it's a three message. Um, you know, recognize that this uh, the part of the human duty is not just the ED and not the ID physician. And once you've diagnosed that cyst, it doesn't end there. Look hard for all the things because that will result in pain. And uh, finally, once you've uh, identified infection, uh, uh, use antimicrobials to uh, select the correct one, select the correct lens, select that dose, and select the correct route within the transition. With this, we can tackle both the sepsis infection without uh, compromising on the ability of antibiotics. Uh, just to mention that I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, Katija and uh, Sharifa uh, had raised. Uh, my uh, additional comment is perhaps uh, awareness should also translate uh, to knowing our own data. We could do, uh, we, we are there, we, we are collecting data on our uh, uh, septic patients, uh, patients with septic shock, and so on. But maybe we could uh, do more with all this data, and maybe we could link up with uh, other uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, as I mentioned uh, right at the beginning, uh, the uh, problem of sepsis is uh, of uh, greater concern in the lower and middle income countries. And, and we are currently using a lot of data from developed countries. So we need to uh, uh, do more in, in that respect. Okay, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank our wonderful speakers for sharing their insights on sepsis. Um, I hope everybody has enjoyed today's uh, discussion. Let us all unite to stop sepsis and save lives. Do remember to tune in same time next week for another interesting episode of Breakfast at FOM. Thank you. Mm -hmm.